You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Welcome to American Sex, the award winning podcast dedicated to challenging those puritanical, backward ass ideals that we have in the U.S. I'm Sunny Megatron, and my co host is Ken Melvoin Berg. We're sexuality educators, pleasure advocates, and ridiculous, sadistic kinksters. We're also non monogamously married to each other. So strap in or strap one on. In this house, your pleasure is power. Your kink is customizable. And your subversive perversions are revolutionary. Welcome, my friends, to episode 195 of American Sex. They make me so happy. It's like, I don't know, aromatherapy for my ears? Is that... I don't know. There's a word for that. You know, brain fog. It happens. Anyway, our guest this week is Evie Lupine. And our topic, asexuality and kink, aka BDSM. So think about what's your gut reaction when I say asexuality and kink? The two most common reactions are one, asexuality and kink. How, How does that work? Kink is a sex thing. And like asexual people don't have sex, right? Or why, yes, of course. Well, there are so many aces in my local community. People on the asexual spectrum and BDSM go together like peanut butter and jelly or paddles and butts or something, right? So anyway, but let's talk about the contradictions in those two different sentences or reactions that I gave. And also bust the myth that all asexuals are, oh, they're sex repulsed. They don't have sex at all. And the ones that do, they sure don't like it. Well, not so much. In this episode, we talk about the imperfectness of asexuality as a label, and really all of the terms and labels we use when talking about sexuality and trying to parse it out, and how that's leading to people defining what asexuality is differently, and then the discourse that spawns from that. Evie and I also talk about how to tell the difference between, well, am I on the A spectrum Or am I not as interested in sex for the myriad of other reasons that that could be, right? And there's lots of those reasons. One of the big ones is, is it responsive desire or is it asexuality? So we get into that. We talk about why so many sex educators and kiki folks and people in sex positive circles, you know, sex geeks, why do they identify as asexual? And how might that relate to the baggage that we all carry about it and how hard it is for some of us to parse all that out. And then in kink, why does kink appeal to so many asexual people? How does kink and asexuality even work? And if you're asexual and you're kind of kink curious, how do you enter the community as someone who's ace? We also get into the does kink belong at pride debate because one of the main talking points for the anti kink at pride folks is well, oh, the asexuals don't want to see your sex right out there in the street, you weirdo leather BDSM people. So we get into all that stuff. This conversation is good. And by the way, if you don't know Evie, you need to, you should. Evie Lupine is an asexual kink educator and a YouTuber, super popular YouTuber. Go look her up on YouTube. Links are in the show notes. And Evie first began her journey into the lifestyle about seven years ago. And in that time, she's been a 24-7 collared submissive, a pet player, a bondage freak, and an occasional sadist. Her passion for learning, as well as her diverse interests within kink, naturally led her in the direction of helping others with their own discovery processes. And she focuses on supporting folks developing happier, healthier relationships while separating the fantasy from the reality of doing BDSM every day. So before we roll that amazing conversation, let's do what we got to do, which is watch the ball. I, oh, 
I love my noises. That's what we call housekeeping here on American Sex Podcast. This one will be real quick, I promise. So first, let me update you on what's going on with Zipper Magazine. If you're like, what's Zipper Magazine? It's a brand new-ish. We've been around five months, four months, something. A digital magazine about all things kink and BDSM. And I am the editor-in-chief. So if you haven't visited ZipperMagazine.com recently or at all, let me tell you what was going on like this week. All about cuckolding. So good. Miss Maya Sinstress, who has been on the show before, and she's amazing, uh, did a video with Zipper Magazine talking about her love of cuckolding fetish. She tells her, I can't believe this happened, but it is a legit true story story, cuckoldress origin story. And also on Zipper Magazine's site, there is a companion article that's a cuckolding primer. You know, it's a, quote, everything you always want to know about cuckolding, but didn't even know to ask. You know, what's a cuck cake? What's a cuck queen spelled Q-U-E-A-N? What's the difference between hot wifing and cuckolding, like in the swing versus the BDSM communities? Hey, is hot husbanding even a thing, right? Plus, there's some outside of the norm scene and dynamic ideas in there. For those of you who maybe don't dig the flavor of cuckolding that's usually portrayed in the media and online, but still there's something about it that intrigues you. Uh, Another highlight. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. From Luna Matadas, who has been on the show many times, uh, the article, To Pee or Not to Pee, A Beginner's Guide to Golden Showers. So much great info. You're in for a big treat. Also, the pun opportunities are just endless. It is a constant stream of fun opportunities. <laughs> Sorry, I just crack myself up. And I do have to say, since we're talking about urine, and a lot of you listening are kinksters, psst, urine is not sterile. Everybody says, oh, it's sterile. It's a myth. It's not sterile. Luna talks about in the article, but I just have to say, if you're like, oh, no, eh, on the risk profile scale, yeah, even though it's not sterile and there's bacteria, so of course there's going to be a risk. Some bacteria is good bacteria. It's, it's, you know, fine. But on that risk profile scale, pee is less risky than other bodily fluids that get splashed around when you're doing the freaky stuff. So it's good news there. Also, in the show notes, just want to point out, which is the episode description, like go to the whatever player you're listening to right now, go in there and look or go to americansexpodcast.com, look up episode 195. There are all the links that Evie and I talk about in our conversation. There's sponsor links and discounts for kink gear and sex toys, all sorts of resources and links. My favorite educational resource for kink, Kink Academy, got the link there. Also the link to our Discord server that we'd love for you to join and a lot more. Oh, speaking of a lot more, my free negotiation mini workbook. So yeah, go go get it. And Patreon, a bunch of awesome stuff. So go check that out. Lastly, we are still mulling around a podcast name change. If you're wondering why this has come up, I explain it in episode 193. Go back, take a listen. We're not getting anywhere. Like I have this whole list of like, maybe this name, maybe that name. And the list basically uh, is just a big brainstorming list of goofy ass BDSM puns that in one respect are fucking amazing because, you know, I love puns, right? I'm a pun sexual, uh, but they're not really like podcast title worthy. So, you know, I'm like, what about this? And everyone's like, oh my God, no. Because honestly, I would listen to a kink podcast called Brain Flog. I mean, come on, it's, but yeah, no. Uh, hey, bad puns is how I roll, spelled E-Y-E rule. Sorry, I had to do that to you. But yeah, if you have thoughts, let me know. We might just go the route of not really doing a total name change and abbreviating like being ASP or something. I don't know. Uh, or like ASP with Sunny Megatron or something. I don't know. We could say it as ASP, but that's a snake and it's kind of weird and it sounds funny, but it also it kind of sounds like ass and there's some pun potential there, like Sonny Megatron's ass or something. <laughs> ass with Sonny Megatron. <laughs> or maybe it'd be voluptuous asp. I don't know. I don't know. Help. So yeah, hit me up on social media if you have any ideas. 
Anyway, that's it. These balls are clean. <laughs> Here is a conversation between Evie Lupine and me about asexuality and BDSM. Okay, American fuckers, I am so excited. Uh, first of all, because if you're listening on like Spotify or Apple, you don't know this, but we switched to Zoom and me and guests can actually see each other for the first <gasps> time, which is kind of cool. Hi, yeah. Evie. Hi. I, Hi. I am so excited. This is, uh, you know, uh, as I told you, a conversation that's a long time coming. Mm -hmm. um, I think the world of you and everything Aww. that you do on YouTube and all of the education that you bring to the world. And I love that you talk a lot about asexuality and kink. Mm -hmm. I find when I talk to my folks, it's this automatic assumption that kink is a sexual practice, that BDSM is all about sex, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And I, 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 I see like the minds being blown as I explain and they're like, what? And that's just in a general conversation for folks who are allosexual or aka not asexual. When mm -hmm. we talk about asexual kink, we're going a whole nother layer. So let's do that. Let's, yeah. let's go to the other layer? I don't know. I'm I'm tired. My brain. <laughs> we'll uh, get through it. We'll get through it. <laughs> so let's start with what is asexuality? Okay. So it's funny you asked this because there's actually been discourse happening on Twitter.com about Ooh. what asexual means or like what it's supposed to be defined as. Because the usual definition that you will hear if you go on wikipedia or on the aven forums which is like a forum that's just for people who are asexual and aromantic and people will say as like the baseline being asexual is a spectrum where you don't experience sexual attraction right and there's this conversation about well does that include desire is it desire or attraction is that like the same thing what does that mean that might be a little bit too high brained even for me to fully it's, understand it's I'm actually like, no yeah. i mean it's not high brain i can't say i understand it because like th your definition that you're telling me is the one that i've always understood that it's mm -hmm. the lack of sexual attraction and lately and maybe this is why this discourse is coming up um Emily Nagoski, who wrote Come As You Are, oh, talked yeah. about um, responsive desire versus spontaneous desire. And mm -hmm. so like spontaneous desire is when like you see someone and you're like, oh, my God, you're hot. Let's fuck. Like I'm in the mood. I'm suddenly horny. And responsive desire, which a lot of women identified folks who are in like your stereotypical cis het relationships will mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of times identify with this type of sexuality is responsive i mean not always there's you know no absolutes mm -hmm. i'm just just statistically and that is and this is me too like i could forget about sex for the next 24 years <laughs> if there wasn't somebody or something or even myself giving myself a kick in the ass like oh hey remember sex it's like oh yeah and then once i get started like my desire is responsive once i get a little you know little foreplay going then i'm like oh oh this is my libido i forgot about that mm -hmm. so so i don't know if this discourse has come up because we've we're talking more in the public sphere about responsive desire and spontaneous desire. I know we just mm -hmm. dived into like philosophy of, of sexual. Yeah. Attraction. I totally know everything you're talking yeah. about. I'm not sure if that's correlated at all, but I think that's a very common thing for a lot of people to experience. Like I got a lot of questions about like, how do I know if I'm asexual or not? And a lot of people that have what I would term primarily responsive desire where they're like i wouldn't think about sex for 20 years unless i had a partner that wanted to do something with me and then i would react to that and i think traditionally and this may be because ace people don't experience attraction so they're trying to like imagine a thing that doesn't exist for them and be like this is the boundary between where i'm at and where other people are and so right. it's fuzzy because of of that reason but for a lot of people that are ace like i'm the same way where it's like if i didn't have a partner that didn't want to have like if I had a partner that didn't want to have sex I wouldn't think about sex for 20 years either and mm -hmm. like it just wouldn't be a, a problem for me and a lot of ace people I think are the same way and then people who are wondering could I be ace could I be ace could I be something else is it just low libido low sex drive it can be very difficult to tease out 
okay, where's the difference between having a responsive desire, a low libido, and just not experiencing attraction? And I think the thing that's the same about like almost all orientations and about asexuality is it's durable over time and over context. Okay. Like, And so it's not just that you only have a responsive desire. It's not just that you have a little libido. There's been some studies about this, though. They're relatively limited because it turns out it's hard to get funding for sex research, even when it's about asexuals. Go figure. (laughs) Uh, And so there have been some studies that demonstrate that people who are asexual have different fantasy lives if they have a fantasy life at all from people who have even things like for example i think it's hypoactive sexual desire disorder where for people who have that disorder they typically experience uh lower libidos lower sex drives but they have a very robust internal fantasy world typically and they want to want to have sex and it's distressing for them and for ace people we're just like I don't know, like, could we get tacos? Like, is that, let's like more on my speed. (laughs) We don't really think about it. Or if we do, it's very, um, it tends to be more self-focused. A lot of studies have shown that asexual people, when we do have fantasy lives for a lot of us, it's, it's very centered on just ourselves, just physical pleasure, not imagining doing other things with other people or other people doing other things to us. So, um, for people who are curious, I would, I would kind of just say, you know, is it that you have a lack of desire and it distresses you and you want to be able to change that? Or is it like, regardless of people approaching you or you seeing other people, like regardless of circumstance, regardless of whatever else, do you desire attraction in some circumstances or not? And there's other like sub labels you can get into, like demisexuality is really common and we can talk about that yeah. if you want to as well. But yeah, that's sort of the synopsis. I, I find the whole thing fascinating because... As a, I don't know, sex positive society, cultural group, whatever, we mm-hmm. have moved towards, which I I think is very correct, and we should move towards things to be more fluid, uh, things that change over time, um, everything's on a spectrum sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then when you, so it's like, add that in. It's like, so people are like, am I asexual? Am I gray sexual? Am I demisexual? Am I, da, 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 am I, uh, I feel like this on Tuesday, but on Thursday, I felt like that. What does that mean? And yeah. then you add to that. Why is that lack of desire there? Like you were saying, it could be responsive versus uh, spontaneous. Mm-hmm. It could be like, there are things like you're on certain medications. Maybe, mm-hmm. you know, you have a hor- There's something medical going on. There's all sorts of, there's trauma. There's all sorts of things. So when I think of all of this, it's like a mushmash of possibilities that are, you know, making a person whatever they feel or whatever their identity is at any given moment that can change for, you know, for some people can Mm. change from time to time. So I find a lot of folks when they are trying to parse out what their identity is Mm. or, you know, put themselves into boxes or give themselves labels on one hand, that's a good thing because that helps you. Like once you name it, you can like understand it and pick it apart. And the, there's value in labeling and naming things, especially mm-hmm. when we're trying to figure out our own identity. Mm-hmm. But then it's a double edged sword because at the same time, we start to like either one box ourselves into a certain identity or get really obsessed with like, what am I? Like, what's my diagnosis? Mm-hmm. What am I? I want an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think it's that simple? or like how how would you how would you advise someone to parse out that complexity because I don't think it's that simple but yeah I mean it is so complex and when I talk about this in videos I usually make a point to emphasize that the labels we use and have right now are not they were not you know given to us by you know ancient aliens or like a god is like here's the principle of human life that you must follow like they're just our best current guesses at trying to categorize in ways that can be labeled a very diverse spectrum of human activity and people are always going to fall between certain categories or kind of fit here and kind of fit there or like have a box that they want to fit into that just doesn't exist and so I do think it is really complicated and when I say that something is durable it's like it can both be durable and fluid like contextually it's durable like it doesn't suddenly change when it's like 
raining on a Thursday, I become a lesbian. And then when it's sunny on Friday, I become like, I become asexual. Like that's not how it works. <laughs> like, but there is fluidity in that. Like over time, as you learn more about yourself and you maybe break down some misconceptions or some stigma, or you come more to terms with who you really are and not what like society was projecting onto you that you should be like, things are going to change. And that might seem like fluidity, but it could also be just discovering what your truest self is. And like, I'm not going to pretend that I know what everyone's inner worlds are like. And if, you know, fluidity is one way for everyone, I think it's always, there's always going to be a multitude of many, many different factors going into what somebody's orientation is. And I know there's a lot of, especially trans women, when they go on HRT, a lot of them describe to me that they end up becoming asexual or feel like they're asexual because of the process of you mentioned like medications and things can really change your desire and how you relate to other human beings and sex. So of course, it's very messy. Yeah, yeah. And I think like about the fluidity, I think maybe it's better put that maybe not that oh, sexuality is fluid. And like you were saying, you don't become a lesbian on Thursday when it's raining. But like, uh, our understanding mm. of our own sexuality is fluid as we peel back more layers of our own, you know, personal onion sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And so a lot of people, when I talk to them about asexuality, one of the common misconceptions is like, they're like, oh, well, asexual people just don't have sex. They don't like sex. They're sex repulsed. And it's uh. like, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain that? Why some asexual people do have sex and why then some asexual people identify as like sex repulsed or whatnot? Mm. What, what's, what's that spectrum? Yeah. So um, um, actually, uh, there's, <laughs> th there's sort of three levels of different ways that most ace people categorize themselves as like relating to sex. And the primary one that most people think of is sex repulsed, which means I don't want to be around sex. I don't want to be near it. I don't want to think about it. It's gross, disgusting. Ew, people making out in a movie too far. hate it. Don't like it. And that, and we can also talk about this. There's sort of a difference between having a personal relationship to the way you feel about sex for you and you interfacing with it and like sex positivity as like a philosophy. Cause just mm -hmm. because you are sex repulsed personally doesn't mean that you're sex negative in a social way where you think that sex needs to be like controlled and regulated. So it's important to also not complete those two things together. But the next level kind of down from that is like sex neutral, which is where I'm at, which is just like ambivalent about sex and is also called sex ambivalent sometimes where it's like, I don't really think a whole lot about it. And I think when I was younger, I think I was more sex repulsed. But as I got into the BDSM community, and I was around nudity a lot more in like a neutral context where bodies were just bodies, and they weren't necess necessarily actively being sexualized, I became more comfortable being around sex and nude bodies and things in a way where it's like, oh, this is just like fine. It doesn't have to be gross. Okay. And mm -hmm. so sex neutral is just like, I don't, I don't really think a whole lot about it. I don't want to necessarily actively try to be involved with it, but it also doesn't disgust me either. Right. And then you also have uh, ace people that are sex favorable, where they do enjoy sex. They may want to pursue sexual relationships for various reasons or be okay and like actively be a participant in wanting to have sex with partners. And that mm -hmm. is very confusing for a lot of people to understand because how can you not experience sexual attraction, but then still be okay with having sex with partners? And I'm not going to like try to make everyone understand that because it is going to be a very foreign experience for a lot of people. But for ace people that do relate to sex in that way, ace people have sex for all kinds of reasons, no matter what part of that spectrum they're on. It could be because they want to have children and that's, for a lot of people, a necessary component of kids and making kids is having sex. Spoiler mm -hmm. alert, that's how babies are made. I don't know if everyone <gasps> ah, listening to this knows that. Then why um, do storks exist? Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, there's that. Obviously, the, the big one thing for a lot of ace people, it's like I want to start a family and doing it any other way is insanely expensive. So and also it usually involves, especially if you're an ace man, like if you want to have kids Either you're having sex with your wife or your spouse or you're like jerking off into a cup and like that's kind of you know, equivalent either way. But in any case, there's that reason. There's like the bonding reason in a relationship where especially for the other partner in order to feel close, like sex is a really big component of like the emotional 
aspect of a relationship and like i like that emotional bonding aspect of the relationship the act itself doesn't matter it could be like a massage it could be oral sex it could be cuddling on the couch but it's about that emotional bonding and this is a tool that we can use for emotional bonding in a relationship Mm -hmm. that my partner happens to enjoy a lot and it's like special for them so why not do it Uh, and then you also have people who understand it as like an important social signifier for a relationship like a lot of people that are not ace themselves like don't understand why you would have a romantic relationship if it didn't involve sex at some Mm. point and so it's like in order to get the kind of relationship that i want that's like treated seriously and as like a serious romantic relationship then sex is going to need to be a component of that and then also finally our parts work for the most part like most ace people we do not have biological issues or hormone issues that mean that our nerves don't work or we don't feel physical pleasure like we're still able to feel physical pleasure and we may not be attracted in the same way to people that we have sex with as non-ace people do but we can still like experience the fun parts of sex just in a different way than a lot of people do not everyone's that way a lot of ace people do masturbate they do have sex with partners but it's it's not a universal thing either yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and i i think that's that part is hard for people to wrap their heads around. They think like, okay, so then, you know, once they're like, oh, so some asexual people have sex, then they're like, well, the ones that are having sex are they're just laying back thinking of England and they, they oh. it's not fun. And it's like, no, it, it can be fun. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it, there's a lot of layers. And I know like mm-hmm. for me, it's interesting because, you know, I've mentioned a few times on the podcast that I'm, I think I'm somewhere on the ACE spectrum. And like for a minute there, I was like, what am I? And then I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to make myself bananas trying to be, you know, I just am what I am. But like, mm-hmm. it's not that I, a lot of people are like, oh, you must have sex all the time. You must like, you know, be so horny all the time because you're a sex educator. First of all, that's not how it works. Uh, Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, it's like, yeah, okay, I have sex. I masturbate. I, you know, I like that sex feels good. Mm -hmm. But if I sit there and I say to myself, when I'm attracted to somebody, do I look at them and think like, I want to fuck you. No, not at all. Like to Mm. me. And I'm like, you know, and has that happened to me? Yes. And that's why I'm like, wait, because it has happened just a couple of times. Like I have more fingers on this hand than the amount of times it's happened to me in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is different than every other time. What's going on here? And again, it's not that I don't want to have sex. It's not that sex isn't mm. fun. It's not that, um, you know, I don't want, like you were saying, you want to get close to that person. There are other reasons you have sex that can be just as enjoyable, but I don't look at someone and have sexual attraction. Mm-hmm. I just have more of attraction, like oh, they're cool. Like that's, oh, you know yeah, what I like mean? More of a platonic kind of like, I want to get to know them and yeah, be friends and it, like hang a out. platonic yeah. and even like a romantic, like I want to mm. be romantic with them, but my mind doesn't go to like, I want to get our genitals wet and mash them together. <laughs> like that, my mind does not go there at all. Mm-hmm. Um, And it's, and it's not like, I don't think I'm, you know, it's not like, oh, I have to know you before I have sex. It's not that. It's just like, that's not my default. I have to go, Mm. oh, yeah, and we also have genitals. Oh, okay, maybe that might be fun. But again, Mm -hmm. if like if I didn't think of it and they didn't think of it, I could just be like, you're cool and dreamy and never fuck and forget that sex exists, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really common for a lot of people to experience that and go through that phase of questioning. It's funny, especially with sex educators, because I like I know more sex educators and BDSM educators that are somewhere on the A spectrum than not. And I think it's almost because sometimes we like academically enjoy like thinking about sex more than actually like having sex. We're like, sex is cool and interesting. I don't really understand that. Let me read more about that. That's like how I got into it initially. Yeah. was like, I had no, like, I, I never had any inclination to like go try to find the porn on like my parents' computer or the porn on the TV or look anything up on Google or do I like no idea about anything. I had to actively like opt into, Oh, I'm in college now. This is what college kids are supposed to do. Let's find (laughs) out more about that sex thing. Like (laughs) no natural curiosity whatsoever with any of that. 
Um, so I don't know if that's true for you as well, but you seem to like resonate with that a little bit. Yeah. And I, I've been reflecting. It's so funny because like, you know, I'm how old am I? 51. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this and I'm still mm. discovering things about myself. And I, I thought that like, I wonder if that's what had attracted me so much to the, you know, the academics or the science or, the, you know, the behavioral science behind sex, because maybe it was my way without realizing it of trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, why? Um, and I and I still I love that part. And like I said, I love sex. I, I masturbate. It feels good. But it's one of those things I have to remind myself to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I think also, even as a sex educator, and even as somebody who is super open about like, I I give no fucks. I don't care what people think about me. I don't, you know, I still I think have had a hard time and I still maybe am having a hard time like parsing that what does that mean about me? Because there is like, mm. this, this like negativity attached when like, someone's like, you're asexual, everyone's like, Ugh. you know, <laughs> which I mean, isn't true. But it's like, that's how we all act. And mm-hmm. I think that and this is just my own theory, maybe the reason so many people in sexuality fields do identify as asexual is because there's so much stigma and so much not understanding about asexuality and what that means about your identity. It's people who are sex educators that have had this long and deep to think about it that are like, holy shit, I think I was fooling myself this whole time. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And now I realize there's nothing wrong with being asexual. There's no shame. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I think a lot more of us and us and just the general sense as people, human beings and whatever uh, social or academic circle you're or professional circle you're in. I think there's a lot more people who are somewhere on the ace spectrum than even have an, an inkling about just because there is so much stigma and so much, so many misconceptions. Yeah, I think. Have you seen the graphs that show like left handedness over time? So there is so for a long time, like I'll try to look it up while we're talking about this. But for a long time, it was like unusual in the greater degree than it is now to be left handed. I'm actually left handed myself. I don't know if there is some correlation between being ace or kinky or left handed. Would love to know that. Um, But for a long time, left handedness was not nearly as common because kids that were left handed were punished for yes. using. And I don't know if you maybe experienced this in school because my, my dad's left handed and yeah. he was like told in school to write with the correct hand, yeah. which was the right hand. And so once we moved away fully from, you know, making kids and like beating them on the hands with rulers and stuff when they would use like the wrong hand the at air quotes wrong hand um you know once that happened we went from like having four percent of the population or like three percent of the population like being left-handed to now it's around like 11 or 12 percent of people are left-handed and so I, I bring that up to say that i think when it comes to especially like minority within a minority like sexual orientations like because most people in everyday life know what being a gay man or being a lesbian Mm -hmm. is but we're still introducing a lot of people to the concept of being asexual and what does that mean and because there isn't that awareness yet and because there's so much repression in society where it's like you're both like sex is both very very controlled and like you're only supposed to have it under these circumstances these times with these people in this setting and yada 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 but also you're sort of like pushed into having sex, even maybe you don't want to because, well, you're married now and that's what you should do to please your husband. And it's not your wifely duty and all that kind of crap. Uh-huh. And so now that people know there's other options, and especially because the way that most and I grew up in like a Catholic household. So maybe this is like my own upbringing. But from my understanding growing up is that like women were not really like women liking sex was not part of the equation. Right. Like it was like. Oh, it's for the husband. Like you do it to have children and that's what you do. And like, you kind of get through it. And so because of that, it took me a long time to understand that I was asexual because I just thought like, oh, women don't have orgasms. Women don't like sex. Like that's Mm -hmm. just, you know, that's how it is. That's our lot in life. And then I'm like, oh, wait, women normally, even though society says otherwise, women do like want to have sex and physically enjoy it and pursue it in this way that I just don't care about. Okay, let's look into that a little bit more. Uh, And so. 
I do think that people are starting to become more aware of asexuality because of that. We are going to see more and more people identifying as it because they know it's like, especially for like men, for example, a lot of ace men get told that they must be gay because they don't want to have sex with women. But they're like, well, I don't really want to have sex with I don't really have sex with anyone, men, women, anywhere between like that's not on their radar. And so I think we're going to see some shifts in terms of like, I think more people are going to start understanding they're somewhere on the a spectrum and there was recently some research that was done in the uk where i think it went from being like one percent of the population was somewhere on the a spectrum to now it's two percent identifies being somewhere on the a spectrum and the way those numbers work out is it's like five percent of gen z and like two or three percent of like gen x and millennials and like one percent of boomers Wow. So, and I yeah. guess I can see like the cultural influences. That makes sense to me. You know, when I look at what each generation, I guess, has been taught in the messaging about what it means to to be a human, you know, amongst mm-hmm. other humans. Um, and another thing I just wonder, I don't know if you've heard anything about this, or I'll just like plop it out there for the listeners to just think about and like maybe have an existential crisis about later, Mm -hmm. like save this for later listeners, Um, is for me, I think a lot of it, me not really understanding me or me trying to like fit into what I thought that mold was supposed to be like me as a woman or a wife or a girlfriend or you know, whatever, was neurodivergence for me. Oh, yeah. Because Mm -hmm. like, I... All, my whole childhood and most of my adulthood until just recently when I'm like, you're neurodivergent, you know what this means. And I've been having like all of these epiphanies, right? Is that I think that was part of my masking. Like I was just trying oh. to fit in because I felt so different. Mm-hmm. And I know like for me, one of the things that I've realized recently is my expression of gender is masking for me. Oh, I, okay. I don't feel, you know, it's not like I f- I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm gender nonconforming or I feel like like I want to identify different or blah, blah, blah. I just, gender has no impact on me. It's like, Mm. I don't care, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I present as femme because that goes with my aesthetic. It's a way to fit in. I could figure Mm. out how to do it. But am I like, ooh, makeup and... I don't give a fuck. I just, do, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I yeah. realized like, oh, I'm just performing my gender as a mask because I mm. needed to figure out how to exist, you know? And I'm yeah. wondering if like for some folks and even for me, if my uh, degree of aloe or asexuality is also influenced by that masking too. I think there is because I, I know a number of people that are, asexual or the opposite that they're hypersexual and either they have especially like autistic women i find all the autistic women in my life are like either they do not give a shit about gender presentation or sex whatsoever they're like i'm gonna dress however i want i'm gonna dress like this like character from the 90s in a tv show i really like and like that's what their gender presentation yeah (laughs) and other than that they don't really care and then i know a number of other autistic women that they say they relate to sex in more of a way that's like what hetero cis men are like supposed to perform as sexually oh. like we're there like more sexually aggressive they are more active about really wanting to have sex and pursuing sexual relationships to the point where it turns some men off because they're like why are you why do you like sex so much like i get why i like it what's like <laughs> what's the like, they're very particular about the way that they like to do things and they're like i position one two and three and all the other ones i know like you know they have their own sort of divergences within that of what they enjoy but i think there is this layering of how we feel about our sexual orientation and our gender that also deals with the other ways that our brain works right like we're neurodivergent of course it would make sense to me that like that's going to impact all of those other wonderful brain things going on as well yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it's just like oh this is so freaking fascinating Mm -hmm. uh and then one of the other, if we're going down that rabbit hole, we're, we're philosophizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the other things is like, well, hey, we're all working with this definition of sex. That is like we're getting our genitals wet and mashing them together. Mm-hmm. And to really go, all right, is that definition that we've all accepted as sex, both out in society, just in general pop culture and academics and all that is that really sex? You know, so that brings mm-hmm. us to 
kink. There mm-hmm. is um, in a lot of the gender studies and the evolution of that uh, discipline. There's now a lot of thought about, okay, what makes up our sexual orientation is isn't just like, ooh, I look at you and I want our genitals to do things or my mind get tingly or Mm -hmm. erect or whatever, Mm -hmm. that there is your power orientation. Do you feel more submissive or dominant? There's your sensory orientation. What kind of sensations do you like? There are all of these, uh, like you can parse it out into all these other pie pieces Mm -hmm. that might make up, quote, our sexuality. There aren't just mm. what we stereotypically think of like, you know, tab A and slot B kind of thing. Yeah. Um, which brings us to kink. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> kink really does incorporate all of those other little pie pieces that we don't yeah. normally say are sex or sexuality, but hmm, maybe we've been playing with the wrong definition the whole time and they are, or maybe they're not. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, So when it comes to kink and sexuality, a lot of folks, you know, and I'm just thinking of, you know, the folks I talk to, like on social media here and there, you know, they're asking questions at a class or something. And they have the assumptions from society about asexuality that are misconceptions. And they go, well, Mm -hmm. of course, kink is such a sexual practice. And uh, you know, it would be a very uncomfortable environment for asexuals. And then, you know, everyone in the kink community goes, oh, no, no, like half of us are asexual. You yeah. Know? Like it is running, a welcoming The one place. organizing the orgy, I almost guarantee you, is the asexual in the room. We're like, oh, we just want to make sure everyone has condoms and barriers and there's enough lube. Like it was just like, yes. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, I see, like, their brains slowly slide out of their ears and fall onto the floor. And they're like, what? How yeah. does that work? So mm-hmm. explain explain asexuality and kink. Okay. So I, I really enjoy this because I feel like our community goes back and forth about, like, is kink sexual or not? Like, on a 10-year cycle, we're, like, for the run of, like, set of 10 years, but, oh, no, no, it's very, like artistic and emotional and bonding and yada yada and then after that we'll go actually no kink is about sex it's about hot fucking and fucking hot people and like we always go back and forth with the extremes and really for individual people it's always going to exist in different places and for Mm. some people kink is very sexual and that's fine that's wonderful if your kink is all about sex great we're not going to play together but that's awesome happy happy for you And then there are people, even people that aren't asexual, that process kink in non-sexual ways. And I think there's a lot of overlap there in terms of like why people pursue it and why it's enjoyable. For me, I really enjoy BDSM because it allows me a way to bond with and be emotionally close with my partners in a really intense way where our genitals don't have to be anywhere near each other whatsoever. They like weren't even thinking about any of that. It's very raw and real and just as intense as like i think really good sex is for people that don't you know aren't on the a spectrum yeah so that there's obviously that there's like the fact it could be physically enjoyable and pleasurable the fact that it can be you know kind of like a scary movie it can be like playing with these really intense emotions it can be about like you know the thrill and the way that you would get if you went like on a roller coaster or skydiving or something and it's that adrenaline rush uh, it can be about cathartic emotional release or maybe like in your everyday life you don't really have like a safe place to cry but maybe in bdsm spaces you really get that opportunity to do that and pain or whatever else lets you like emotionally let go in a way that you're kind of more locked up about with how you are every day and there's tons of reasons why um and it's kind of funny because i think there's so many reasons that sex is like on the last on that list like it's like 12 other things and then also it can be about sex but especially because all of the wonderful media that we have about bdsm is always (sighs) like a heterosexual sexual romantic relationship where bdsm is an add-on like a sticker that goes on top of the sex where it's like a decoration it's the bow right and it's like no like that that can be a thing for some people but for i think even a lot of people it's very much not that and it's mm-hmm. it's something that exists beyond sex or like even you might have scenes and then like the aftercare is sex but the right. scene itself wasn't about sex it just was like we feel really emotionally close and like what's the next other emotionally close thing we can do putting our genitals together but you know the definition of sex is interesting because i uh you know, a lot of the cis men that I've interacted with in my life, they only count 
vaginal and anal penetration as being sex. And they're like, oh, well, if lesbians do what oral counts as being sex, it's like that's all they can do. But they don't like consider oral sex to really be sex. And I'm like, fascinating. So it's like you yeah. have this like very narrow definition of sex where it's only something penetrating something else. Mm-hmm. Or and it has to be a genital, I guess. But like, I guess a butthole is more of a genital than a mouth is whatever. I don't know. I don't <laughs> understand this hierarchy of holes and fluids. Like, it's literally, wow. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have the opposite end, which is like, is flogging a sex act? So like, more at eleven. Let's debate this. You know, right. Have you been having some odd symptoms and you don't know where to start? Well, I got you. And Everly Well does too. They're committed to supporting your journey towards wellness. Everly Well's women's health test measures 11 biomarkers known to play a role in your overall health and wellness. And it checks for any abnormal levels that may be keeping you from feeling your best. Everly Well is digital healthcare designed for you, all at an affordable and transparent price. With over 30 at-home lab tests, you'll be able to choose the test that makes the most sense for you to get the answers that you need. They also have an STD test, so you can discreetly test for seven types of STDs in the privacy of your own home. Here's how it works. Everly Well ships straight to you with everything you need all in one package. And to take your at-home lab test, you just collect your sample and use the included prepaid shipping label to mail it back to the certified lab. And within days, you'll receive your physician-renewed results. Then you can share the results with your primary care physician to help guide you with next steps. It is so simple. Over a million people have trusted Everly Well to support their health and wellness goals, uh, including me, by the way. And being able to have Everly Well's testing at my fingertips has been everything. And remember, I said I got you, right? Okay, so for listeners of American Sex Podcast, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash sunny. That's everlywell.com slash sunny for 20% off your next at-home lab test. everlywell.com slash sunny. I know you know this story. You're doing all this stuff. Then there's laundry. And then there's the emails. And then there's the errands. And you just like want to sit down. But oh, you forgot to eat. So then you got to cook dinner. And before you know it, the day is over and you're preparing to do it all over again tomorrow. When is there time to focus on what you need? Well, with Calm, you can prioritize your most important to do on your list, which is taking time for you. We've partnered with Calm the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way you feel, reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks, and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. There's even new daily movement sessions too, designed to relax your body and uplift your mind. And if you go to calm.com slash sunny, you got a special offer of 40% off a Calm Premium subscription. You know, over 100 million people around the world use Calm, including me. Right now, I am really digging Calm's masterclasses. There's Creative Living Beyond Fear, Radical Self-Compassion. What's, yeah, even I need that. The Power of Rest. That's what I need. I really dig these. I put them on while I'm walking on the treadmill, doing stuff around the kitchen, and it is great. So again, for listeners of American Sex Podcast, that's you. Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription. Go to calm.com slash sunny. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash sunny, S-U-N-N-Y, for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's Calm dot com slash sunny. I don't understand <laughs> this hierarchy of holes and fluids. Like, it's literally, wow. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have the opposite end, which is like, is flogging a sex act? So like more at 11, let's debate this, you know? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really think that 
you know, there's so many different debates when it comes to, like you were saying, there's argument on Twitter about what is asexuality. And Mm -hmm. there are so many debates about like, well, what is, what is, uh, you know, sexual orientation? What is gender orientation? And I honestly think that most of these debates and disagreements stem from the fact that we have our definition of sexuality wrong and that it's too Mm. narrow. I really think if we were to expand our definition of sexuality to like, uh, yeah, flogging without doing anything with genitals because you're having this sensory experience or, you know, whatever the qualifiers are, if we consider that sex, it would change so many of the things that we're arguing about and so many of the other definitions Mm -hmm. and orientations. I don't know. That's just my my theory when I'm Mm -hmm. sitting home thinking about things. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's this term, especially from like 80s BDSM and like 90s of like leather sex, right? Mm -hmm. Of this idea that like, even though the things we're doing maybe don't directly involve genitals, it's so intense and so physical in a way that's basically like sex without it being conventionally understood to be that way. So I think like, even the early kink community had this understanding of like the things that we're doing, what it is that we do, right? Could be considered sex, even though our genitals aren't really interacting in any way. And certainly there's a lot of like things that I would count as being sex acts that do not involve that. Like, like when somebody's being cuckolded and they're like in a closet somewhere, their genitals aren't doing anything, right? Like, unless they're masturbating, I guess. Like, Mm -hmm. but they're not involved in the sex, but they're still experiencing a sex act, even though it's the other people involved actually touching their genitals, right? So clearly I think, you know, we already have the kernel of understanding of like, okay, some things that maybe don't always involve genital stimulation could still be sex and for a lot of people the part about sex that they enjoy is like the more mental component of it right be that from a power exchange relationship or people that get really turned on by like the sound of their partner's voice or like the things that get said right the part like the the genitals are sort of like the engine that kind of gets the machine going maybe but the thing that actually is the experience of it is the the mental part or the talking part of the emotional part mm-hmm. yeah and and that's how i define you know when i'm teaching my one-on-ones i define kink as like rather than you said uh people think the sex is the foundation and bdsm is the icing on the cake or whatever mm-hmm. for me it's like no uh, BDSM is all about like, like the brain fuck kind of it's all up here in your head. And you have this toolbox of things that you can choose from to give your partner or yourself an emotional, a sensory or whatever it is kind of experience. And just like you can choose, you could pull a flogger out of that box and and use that or a Wartenberg pinwheel. You can also pull traditional like genital, something's getting engorged sex out of Mm -hmm. that box and use it as a tool in your BDSM but you don't have to like mm-hmm. it tends to be a really popular tool that a lot of people use but it's not necessary and and i i like that you said that people who aren't having traditional sex within their bdsm scenes are not necessarily asexual people they're mm-hmm. like very highly sexual people that would be like fucking in any other situation where they're just like that it, this this is kink that's that they don't Mm -hmm. go to that's aftercare maybe or that's um Mm -hmm. and i know like for me again i'm one of those people my sexuality is a factor or not doesn't matter to me kink is kink it is not they're two different feelings it's like i love alaskan king crab legs and i love cheesecake but if you were to mash them together and shove them in my face, I'd be like, what the fuck? Like, they're both ruined now. Like, to me, that's... I'm, just, I'm picturing a wet and messy place scene that yeah. involves, like, sitting on a cheesecake while also trying to eat, like, Dungeness crab legs yes. or, like, Alaskan crab legs. Like, listen, you could make those work together in a kink scene. You could, but- yes. Yes. But yeah. But that's yeah. how I look at sex and kink. Like they're both amazing. But when I try to mash them together, it's like bleh, 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 bleh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um and and I usually like the cheesecake after the crab legs. You know, and for me, I don't mind if I'm playing with somebody else where 
for them, it is very sexual. And maybe they're getting off. They're having – like, I can't orgasm while I'm trying to concentrate on kink things. They just – my wires get crossed. It is – it's like doing the tap your head and do your stomach. I can't do them at the same time. But, like, if – my partner is sexual or I'm doing sexual things to my partner, but I'm not required to like get horny and feel sexual myself. Mm -hmm. Fine. But for me, I am using sex to affect my partner in some sort of power play. To me, the sex Mm. is all, it's a tool for a power play. It's not like, Ooh, orgasms. Great. But Mm -hmm. you know, and I just, I find it fascinating talking to different people about like how how does your sex integrate into your kink or not. Mm -hmm. And there are as many unique different answers as there are people answering Mm -hmm. it. It's freaking amazing. So have you talked to people who are ace? Um, And I'm for me personally, and this is just anecdotally, I'm tending to see this a lot with like the younger Gen Zers who are just coming into adulthood. Um, Mm. And it usually comes up in June when we have the does kink belong at pride debates. Yeah. Yeah. And I will I will hear from a, you know, demographically, they are a group of younger Gen Zers who are like. I don't want your sex stuff in my face at Pride. And all the kinksters are going, but it's not inherently sexual. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So do you run into kinksters that are like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you that there's there's ace people in the kink community. Get out of here. Well, I think it's funny because when you have those debates, it's very often like, oh my God, but ace people are going to be at Pride and you can't bring you can't bring your sex acts around the ace people. I'm like, listen. There are men in thongs on floats. There are topless. There's boobs everywhere. Like, yeah, if you're going to the kind of pride parades that I've been to and that I would want to go to, frankly, like, I'm not going to go to the kids pride parade where it's like, you know, balloon animals and face paint, unless it's right. adult face paint and balloon animals. In which right. Because I also am into clown kink. So I'm yeah. all okay. about the clown balloon kinks animals. Accepted. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> but, you know, I like I think it's funny that's like, well, you know, the leather vest and the leather hats, that's a step too far. But the 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 thongs and everything else like that's that's fine. We're going to keep that. And it's I get um, I feel bad for Gen Z because I feel like they're growing up in sort of a weird time where it's like I cannot imagine like if the last like half of my teenage years had been during the pandemic. Yeah. And like I hadn't really gotten to socialize. And also I'm kind of dealing with sort of like this like weird media messaging around sexuality. Like I totally get that, but it's very ahistorical to sort of like treat pride as this thing that like kink is removed from. And it Mm -hmm. makes me feel sad because at the time, and I'll give kind of a brief synopsis because this isn't really the subject for this conversation. The subject is whatever we, it, the world is our oyster or our ball awesome. gag. We can talk about it, whatever the frick we awesome. want. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So like kink at pride, right? It's kind of always been there, right? It mm-hmm. was like the, I'm going to say the word dykes. That's labeled these for themselves. I'm sorry. That offends people. But like leather dykes would like go on their fucking motorcycles and they would be the ones like protecting the OG pride parades from the police that wanted to shut them down and hose them and arrest them. Mm-hmm. Like kink people have always been there doing fundraisers, being the protectors and and have marched alongside these people for as long as these kinds of events have been happening for and it was more in a retroactive capacity where later people that were like oh my gosh we're not going to be accepted by heterosexual society if we have these people dressing like this being associated with us we're gonna rip their pictures out of the magazine we're going to hide that history and burn it and get rid of it and now we're having this play out in the long scheme of things where the younger generation doesn't know that history because it's been erased effectively to Mm -hmm. some capacity where they don't realize that kink's always been there. And I think kind of the solution I fall into is like, okay, if you want to have your family friendly, you know, safe for work, no thongs, no whatever pride event. I don't know why I keep going back to thongs, but that's the, Hey, (laughs) that's the thing. It works. Um, and so like, I think, okay, have that in the morning, in the afternoon, but like, there's always going to be an adult evening pride parade where as long as they're following the rules, like you can't get mad at the rules, right? That's my thing. Or if the right. rules say leather is allowed kink displays of like people just, cause it's not like people are going to kink 
people are going to pride parades and doing kink stuff and are like doing a flogging in like the middle of the street. No, they're just like wearing leather. They might be right. wearing a mask. Puppy hoods. Like, yeah. yeah. Hoods, a collar. Like, I don't know. I've never, the only evidence I've ever seen of that are people like mistakenly taking a picture of like some kind of like, like a Montreal fetish weekend thing. And then being like, Oh my God, look, the kinky people are doing stuff. And it's like, no, that's from a completely different right. event at a, whatever. So, like, uh, like it's like, okay, well, kink isn't happening. So, what you're really arguing is that kink shouldn't be visible. And then it's like, okay, well, the history of, like, what kink is identified as looking like with, like, leather and latex, that's also very much tied up in, like, general, especially gay men's fashion. And so, like, at what point do we just say you're not allowed to, like, visibly look queer in any capacity? Right. And so, in any case, I don't know any ace people that are, like, actively offended by pride parades involving people wearing leather or mm-hmm. anything like that, because there's a lot of ace people that are also would want to march with that contingent at a pride parade. And a lot, I'll tell you this, a lot of ace people, we own harnesses, we own fishnets, we mm-hmm. own big stompy boots. Like, we want to wear them outside as well. So if you start making rules about what ace people, because also, like, it's sort of like this weird stereotype of what ace people look like or are comfortable with. And it's kind of infantilizing in a way that I don't love. Like, okay. In the most charitable way possible, you want it to be a, you know, warm, welcoming space for us. But I'll tell you, like, there were, there were, uh, you know, LGBT alliances and there were all kinds of events on the campus I went to for college where there was, uh, and I forget the exact term that they used, but there was essentially like um, an LGBT resource center and community event space where like you could do stuff that was like LGBT related. And I, I like, I f- felt more comfortable and accepted as an ace person in kink spaces or at pride parades or at Folsom. I'm wearing a Folsom shirt from the last time I went there Yay! right now. Um, you know, I felt more accepted and welcome in those spaces than I've ever felt in like a vanilla LGBT space. Not to say they're bad, but they don't feel like they're mine you know they don't mm-hmm. feel like they're my home it kind of feels like i'm sort of like well you're technically allowed to be here but like try not to take up too much space that's yeah. the vibe i got but that was like 2014 so mm-hmm. you know, no hopefully I, it's changed in that i time. totally i'm with you right there on the same page so like okay so for i hope and I know, I'm not going to hope, I know mm. that there have been uh, American fuckers listening, which was what we call our listeners of American Sex Podcast, mm-hmm. that have had some light bulbs like, oh, this explains a little bit about me or whatnot. And I'm sure some of those people may be kink curious. So as we wrap up this conversation, can we give some advice to those folks? If you are ace, somewhere on the ace spectrum, but you're like, huh, I am really interested in kink. And or maybe you just realized like, oh, I didn't realize there's so many ace people in the kink community. How do I start? How do I go into a community that is like still very, let's say you go to a munch, there are going to be people at that munch that are, you know, very highly sexual people or that are flirty or whatever. How do you start entering into a kink community or investigating kink as an asexual person? person do you have any advice for those folks yeah i think there is definitely a lot of ways to enter the kink community that are more friendly for ace people and i think definitely every munch is going to be different like and it depends on who's running it i've been to munches where it's like very much the conversation is like the the environment itself has never been like people are taking their titties out and like it's that doesn't happen to be clear uh but it's like the conversation might go in a more sexual direction and it might not be super comfortable for you, but every munch is going to be different. I might start actually by like looking for online munches. So like a munch for people who don't know, is like, it's basically a social gathering where there's no play. It's not about picking people up or finding dates. It's just about socializing with other kink people. It's a really good entry point for new people. And because of the pandemic, there have been a lot more online events that have been created. And there used to be before I moved, there was a munch that was for asexual people that were also kinksters. I lived in a really big city, so it's not going to be accessible for everyone. But I know if I looked online right now and I look for an asexual munch on FetLife, I am sure there is one being organized. So it depends on like 
do you like maybe already have a relationship and you want to open up the relationship so it has kink involved in it? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to try and find a partner to do kink with locally? Or do you just want to explore the concept and you're like, online's great. Long distance is great. I just want to learn more and kind of explore for myself, maybe do some kind of more solo things. Online munches are great for that. Uh, If you are someone who wants to go more and explore in real life in person, typically there are like newbie nights at dungeons. There are orientation nights or like open houses. I would maybe go to those because they're more newbie centric. Uh, It's kind of interesting because I feel like the higher level you get with King in terms of intensity, uh, the less likely you are to see sex. Uh, Like usually the newbie parties, I find that most people are like, they don't want to try too much. They don't really know a whole lot about. And so unless it's facilitated where like there's, maybe stations where you can try out different toys or, or see different things. If it's not being facilitated, just newbies with other newbies, you're going to see a lot of like genital touching and that may or may not be comfortable for you. Um, but I do recommend newbie parties in general because it's a good way to meet other newer people who maybe aren't going to come in with as many preconceptions about like, hmm, well, I've been a master for 20 years and I think, you know, you don't want to get into those arguments with people that think they, you know, know the universal truth of bdsm and you're less likely to run into those people when you're going to a newbie event where you all mm-hmm. kind of are on the same page as far as your experience level right. uh, and then also just like read the event description read what's going to be allowed read what's typical right because different dungeons have different vibes depending on who runs it and who's running that particular event so some dungeons some spaces are going to be very sex focused and like don't go to the orgy party for your first BDSM event because that's probably not going to be your jam. But there may be like a general impact play night where they say like, hey, if sex is a lot at this venue, but only in like these spaces, right? So you Mm -hmm. have more separation between you and the sex happening. But as far as like conversations go with people and meeting people, I have personally very rarely had an issue with anyone, any age range, like being like, oh, you're asexual? Like, what the fuck is that about? Like, and being weird and judgmental about it. As long as you are proactive, if you're like trying to play with somebody and you tell them, hey, I'm ace. I really don't want to have anything involved with sex or genitals. This is what this means to me. Like, because that could mean like, okay, I want to stay fully clothed or it could mm-hmm. mean like, I want to be nude, but don't touch me. So you got to be very specific about what it is that you're comfortable with or not. And that's going to vary for individual people as it always does. Mm-hmm. But, you know, read the rules, see what the event has to say as far as, you know, what is allowed genital wise or sex wise at the event. And then just go to the ones where it's like, oh, OK, this event doesn't seem to be very sex. Focused. And also you can always message the event organizers and you can always go. And like if you decide in the first 10 minutes, the vibe is off and you're like, these aren't, these aren't really my people. You don't have to stay the whole time either. It's just about exploring and experimenting. And it might take a couple tries before you find the right space. Like I moved recently and I'm still trying to find like where my new group of people is at because it's like, oh, okay, this is like Portland. I live in Portland right now. Uh, Almost all of the BDSM clubs are just like swingers clubs that have BDSM nights. And that's same like, here in Vegas. I moved yeah, from Chicago to Vegas idea. and it's like, mm-hmm. womp, womp. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. why I say read the rules is because I have uh, proactively eliminated many spaces that say that they have BDSM parties or advertise on Fat Life because I'm like, okay, so there's like different cover charges for men versus single women versus couples. And then they talk about, you know, test results and they have a sex room. I'm like, okay, this might not be for me. So you got to be a little bit of a sleuth when it comes mm-hmm. to, you can't just show up anywhere and expect to have a good time. But if you do your legwork and if you meet people by going to a munch, you can ask them and say, Hey, I want to go to a party or a play space where like, there's not really going to be a lot of sex. Like, where is that? And that might be private parties. It might be people right. who host stuff at their homes and they are not really into the sex for like sex club vibe. And so at their own home, it's very like, okay, We do high protocol stuff, service stuff. We have a crossover here, but like most people do not take their clothing off because, or they don't have sex at least because, you know, if they do it, they're going to go to a bedroom instead of doing it like out in the the middle of my living room. 
Yeah. And I also want to point out for folks too, whether you're asexual and you're looking for a place that where there isn't a lot of sexuality or you want a place where there is a lot of sex, it also depends on the state, the county, like yes. what they legally allow. I was mm-hmm. shocked because I came up kinky in Chicago where it's like anything was allowed. You know, there was sex in dungeons, whatever. And I went to Michigan We uh, and I, it was, I think it was Grand Rapids or something. Mm-hmm. Went to a kink club and it's like, Nobody, nobody's fucking like nobody. And it, I realized it, I didn't know it wasn't allowed. And I was like, oh, my God, some dungeons don't. Allow. So it all depends where you are. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that legwork is important. Um, yep. And then for those who just want to find out a little bit more about being ace, are there, um, you know, websites or discussion forums or places that you would recommend that people go to either talk to other ace people or read a little bit more, maybe books or what would you advise there? Yeah. Um, there's a ton of great stuff. So, uh, there's definitely a lot of YouTubers that talk about asexuality. Uh, there's a lot of people on Twitter. There's a pretty good Twitter community of ace people. Even if you just follow like mentions of asexuality on Twitter, you'll find people. Uh, There's the AVEN forums I mentioned before. Um, Mm -hmm. I've never really been active on them, so I can't necessarily speak to their quality in any way, but that was like the home place, especially in the early 2000s. We were first trying to get a community belt of other ace people. It's it's, Like it sounds, it's A-V-E-N, the AVEN forums. Uh, Definitely Tumblr, I think, still has ace people on it Mm -hmm. for sure. I'm trying to think of any specific books I can recommend off of the top of my head and there's one that just came out that i was like really looking into like being excited about reading and i want to say it was like um i'm gonna have to because okay if i take yeah. a second like, yeah some no you up. know what we'll, we'll do we'll follow up i'll put it all in the okay. show notes as i do for every episode anything that we talked about i'll put the link to the forums okay, awesome. i'll put you know whatever else we tell I'll, I'll listen back i don't know what we talked about when, when i listen to it and i edit it i'll make little notes i'll put be like links. oh that was we'll, a great we'll so glad good. we talked about that exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly um and so this has been amazing i think that this is a topic that we need to talk more about and mm-hmm. that a lot more people have some kind of proximity to asexuality, whether it's themselves, whether it's, you know, partners, friends, whatever, then we all realize because we all don't know what it is and we don't talk about it. So this is a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you talk about all sorts of great stuff. So tell folks where they can find you. And again, American fuckers, if you're like, I'm driving, I can't write down the YouTube channel. Don't worry. All the links will be in the show notes for this episode. Mm -hmm. And also mine's easy to remember. So it's not that hard. But thank you so much for having me on. I'm so glad we got to talk about this. I feel like I'm like an asexual godparent sometimes where I'm like every single time I talk about it. I know if I mention it a couple of times, the wheels start turning in a couple people's brains and then something in their life that they've been like, that doesn't make sense. Starts to make sense. And I love getting to contribute to that process and just raise more awareness for people that maybe are ace themselves have a partner who is and they're like i don't really get this like what does this mean happy to do it love to do it if they want to find more from me i'm evie lupine pretty much everywhere my main thing is i'm on youtube i'm a youtuber i make videos twice a week about all different topics asexuality kink bdsm relationship advice all sorts of stuff on there i'm on twitter if you want my sassy hot takes of which there are many uh, also <laughs> Evie Lupine on there and I have a Patreon where that is like that is my main source of income that is what makes everything possible that I do because YouTube uh, pays me like $200 a month Ugh. so Patreon is like the place to go uh, I have a Discord chat on there there's so many people in my community that are on the A spectrum are neurodivergent are all different kink labels all different ages experience levels it's really really wonderful and then i also do exclusive videos that are a bit more personal on my patreon as well but yeah i'm evie lupine pretty much everywhere that is where to find me and again thank you so much for having me on thank you thank you thank you all right we will uh i don't know we'll catch up again there's so many yeah, other things so we sure. can talk about until then thank you and bye bye Thanks for listening to American Sex. What's that? You want more? Well, you can start by streaming our TV show on Showtime, Sex with Sunny Megatron. Then pop on over to SunnyMegatron.com. Everything's there. You can get updates on my new book, check out my sex ed and BDSM workshops, learn how to book me for your organization or for coaching. You know, we also want to hang out with you too, right? So come join our Discord community 
or follow along on TikTok or Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. I'm Sunny Megatron everywhere. And you can catch Ken on Twitter or tune in to his weekly D&D games on Twitch. If you want to support the show, a great way to do that is simply to tell people about it. Make a TikTok or tweet about your favorite part of this episode. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review too. And if you're a ride or die American fucker, you're going to want to join our Patreon community. We'll send you official American fucker stickers and you'll get a lot more too at patreon.com slash American sex. Now, just in case you happen to be one of the few that still has disposable income in this late stage capitalist hellscape, well, when you're shopping for a new sex toy, BDSM gear, Kink Academy membership, or other things, please patronize our sponsors and affiliates. You'll get a discount and it helps us too. Win-win. All those links and codes are in our show notes. Thanks, American fuckers. We appreciate the heck out of you. See you next time.